Welcome everyone. Sai Ram. Namaste. I'm Connie Shaw, and this is my wonderful husband, Jim Wright. We have another fully packed program today with a new skill sets, amazing healing stories, and inspirational uplift for you. Now Jim is going to read a poem by Rumi. Be a lamp. Be a lamp, a lifeboat, a ladder. Help someone's soul heal. Walk out of your house like a shepherd. Thank you, Jim. Now we'll start with a short prayer to our beloved Holy Spirit with thanks for all that he does for each of us continually. This is called the Holy Spirit Fire Prayer. Beloved Holy Spirit, we thank you for your continual love and mercy we ask you to please rain down your cleansing fire of healing, clarity, and strength to all those present, to their families, communities, and leaders. Please ignite the children and young adults of the world to receive the gifts of the Spirit, which you've promised to do, and give them the willpower to align with God's will and to lead their peers in purity and give them the zeal continu to continue to be pure vessels of healing and resurrection as they have been doing around the world recently through God's tremendous grace and mercy. Fill us to the brim, Holy Spirit, and let us overflow with your compassionate love. Use all of us as your instruments to open minds and hearts of others to the awareness of your eternal presence within them. We decree that soon we will all bring world peace, joy, and love and expand the new golden age of peace and plenty in the awareness and experience of every species. It is done. We thank you and amen. Today, after the Masters of Light slideshow and quantum gazing, we're going to work with two skill sets and tell you eight healing stories. One of the skill sets is clearing the eyes. The second one is how to do fast, easy manifesting without any strain or anxiety. Following that, we'll tell the eight teaching and healing stories about people who are just like you, who are doing remarkable work through their profound gifts of the Spirit. There are also four new gifts of the Spirit, which we're adding to our list of 80 for a total of 84 gifts. Further, we'll have numerous educational and inspirational charts, as well as invaluable resources in the way of books and videos to help you to live a life of love, peace, and mastery. Through our programs, and other online programs, you can learn to have mastery over time, space, distance, gravity, and form. Of course, that is with God's grace. We're still working on mastery in various areas, and as soon as we feel we've mastered a particular gift of the spirit or skill set, we share it with you. This is your birthright as children of our divine Father, to express these gifts. The next online quantum gazing live stream will tentatively be on July the 9th, 2022 at 2 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. We'll let you know as soon as we know. We're going to be away during June. You know, of course, that we're not medical doctors. Although Lord has healed well over 45,000 people through us entirely due to his divine love and mercy for each of you. Here's our disclaimer before this, we see the Masters of Light slideshow. If you don't have a notebook ready, this is a good time to get something for taking notes of the quotes and skills we will focus on today. And now we will watch the Masters of Light slideshow.
sure that many of you are now getting very familiar with who the masters are. And we did not uh, decide which masters to put in the slideshow. It was people who attended gazing who saw masters. And if two or three people saw the same master, then we, they told us and we put it in the slideshow. But we didn't decide on any of the masters to go in the slideshow. We think that would probably not be the right thing to do for us to impose our situation on everyone else. So, in preparation for gazing, if you would please uncross your legs, that is if you're not sitting cross-legged on the floor, uncross your legs and your knees and your ankles, and place your hands face up in a receptive position and lay them down on your thighs or your legs somewhere where it's comfortable. And now if you would get three or four wishes or prayers or attentions in mind, and they can be for yourself or any of your loved ones, things that would make your lives better if they came into your lives or that would make your lives better if they left your lives. Now they can be anything at all. They can have, be in any category at all. People often think of things having to do with their health or their relationships or their financial situation, with their spiritual life or their life purpose, with their emotional situation, with their selfless service activities or their leadership roles, anything at all. But get them very, very clearly in your mind right now. Just Let's just take a brief moment and do that. gazing, as most of you know, you just look at the screen with a very soft, almost unfocused look. There's no need to try to transfer any energy to us. Just a soft look is all that's required for doing gazing. And at the same time, allow your mind to become blank. Let your thinking stop. Let your thoughts just simply drain away so that you have an empty mind. We know that can be challenging. And so if you notice during gazing that your thoughts have come back, that you're thinking about something, that's okay. But since you've noticed it, just go back to empty mind. And if you have to do that more than once, that's okay too. Before each gazing, we do a preparation that is a visualization and a breathing exercise. We're going to do this three times. So let's all breathe in deeply. Raise your shoulders up towards your ears. Now breathe out and imagine your consciousness dropping down into your heart center right in the center of your chest. At the end of the out breath, notice how it feels in your heart center. Let's do that again. Breathe in deeply, shoulders up towards your ears. Big breath out, consciousness down into your heart center and notice how that feels at the end of your out breath when you're connecting with all that is. One more time. Deep breath in, shoulders up towards your ears. Now breathe out, consciousness down into your heart center. Noticing that feeling of connection with those that are near and dear to you. And sometimes they'll feel that exact instant when you're making that connection. Now close your eyes and imagine your consciousness is going out into the universe to connecting with your idea of the quantum field of love. And experiencing that quantum field of love totally enveloping you, totally wrapping around you, totally enclosing you in its warmth in caressing and caring. 
because you are loved. And you are love. Now open your eyes again and come back into the room. This is the time, if you haven't already done it, to hold up photos of any loved ones that you would like to have participate in gazing. It's as powerful for the people in the photos that you hold up as it is for you who are present watching us now. And if you would like, you can have pictures spread on the floor in front of you or on poster board in front of you or just hold up one or two in your hands in front of you. It's all just fine. And now we'll begin.
Thank you, beloved Lord, Masters, Angelic Hosts, Jim, and all of the attendees. <coughs> Pardon me. Mosters, uh, most of the Masters of Light and the avatars that you saw in the slideshow were known for their lifetimes of selfless service to the poor and the suffering. Now, all of the religions of the world stress selfless service as a way to grow spiritually, a way to help the needy, and to demonstrate for our children and families the importance of giving to, sharing with, and of comforting others outside the family as a way of building cohesive, cooperative, loving communities. The role of women in society has always been a vital part of this timeless virtue of service. For the next thousand years, it's going to become predominant. In fact, the role of women in society, as you know, is changing greatly and rapidly changing as we enter the era of the divine feminine to restore peace, love, unity, and balance on the planet. As you'll see in the next few charts, women have largely forgotten who they are and why they're here as leaders in homes, in countries, in the workplace and as divine beings for the next thousand years, as we said. When women forget their sacred function, societies suffer in drastic ways, and we have abundance evidence of that now. Here are three quotes. Uh, the first is, when forgiveness occurs, miracles happen. And also, surrender is acceptance of what is. <coughs> Pardon me. And don't be a tall poppy or extra special in appearance in your everyday life. Tall poppies are the first people to be cut down. And this is a quote by Satya Sai Baba. Now then, we have another chart which starts with the joy, the very joy derived from service. Jim, I think we skipped one of the charts. So I'll just read the chart that's up there. The very joy derived from service reacts on the body and makes you free from disease, Satya Sai Baba. You're all, separate, self, you're all separate beads strung together on that one thread of God, Satya Sai Baba. And finally, another quote by Sai Baba, the mother is the pillar of the home of the nation and also of humanity itself. When women of a nation cease to respect themselves and forsake modesty and morality, then the invisible canopy of divine protection over the nation will be rent or torn, and continual calamity and disaster will ensue until women return to demonstrating dharma or righteousness in all aspects of the home and society. So, as God tells us continually, if women don't respect themselves, then children and men will not respect them either. Now then, the countries that Sai Baba has said have lost the canopy of protection because of women and men becoming very dissolute, then those countries are France, Germany, Japan, the UK, and the US. That is France, Germany, Japan, the UK and the US. So we all have our work cut out for us, women, men, and children, to bring our homes, our communities, our states, and our nations back into alignment with God's will and back into purity and love and compassion for all beings. We're now moving into the era of miracles and those of you who have studied The Course in Miracles know that forgiveness and purification are first necessary before each of us can be used as strong, dependable vessels for God's healing and miracles. God is the doer and each of us is but the vehicle. We're going to show you one more teaching chart and then we'll share some extraordinary stories about how the Lord is using very ordinary people, even children, even toddlers, for his remarkable miracles.
Now we showed the um, charts about the importance of forgiveness and not to be a tall poppy in your everyday life. Now we'll have three charts on the four new gifts of the Spirit. This week, Connie was very surprised to discover four new gifts of the Spirit, of which she has three, but she didn't know the names of them. The first is called the Transfiguration. It can appear in two different aspects, and both of them have been reported to her via email by gazing attendees. The first aspect of Transfiguration is when faces or figures of perfected beings are superimposed on the face or body of a devotee or apostle during prayer or meditation, during healing or gazing. For example, Tr Stephen Turoff, the UK Psy devotee who is a psychic surgeon, or Connie Shaw, or others. And by the way, Jim, as you know so well, for 11 years, dozens of people have been telling us that they have seen um, such a Sai Baba or Jesus, Mary, Prema Sai Baba three times, and Kuan Yin superimposed over my face during gazing. And I just thought, oh, well, that's interesting. That's probably their imagination. And I didn't even know it was a gift of the Spirit. And I didn't know that it has happened to various other people around the world. I did not discover that until this week when I was reading the book, Stephen Turoff, Psychic Surgeon, that was given to us by our dear friend, Roshan Motivala in California. Now also, people have reported that they've seen Sai Baba and Shirdi Sai Baba over Jim's face. The so, second aspect of the transfiguration is when the inner light of the person transfigured is so bright that it briefly obscures their head and torso or their entire body. You may recall in the New Testament of the Bible that when Jesus came down from the mountain after his 40 days in the wilderness, his face and form were radiantly transfigured. And also, I'd just like to say, so that you understand, the reason that we tell you about various things that have happened to us is because for the most part, <laughs> we haven't known what was happening. We didn't know there were names for these phenomena. And if these things have already started happening to you and you didn't realize they were gifts, or they're happening to your loved ones, or your friends and family tell you about them, now we can all be um, enlightened together about what is happening. It's God's grace and mercy that is being given to each of us. So we're not anything special whatsoever. Absolutely not. We're just trying to be educators and to inform you when new things happen to us, we try to find out what it means or what it's called so we can share it with you. And many of you have many gifts of the spirit that we don't have and we're thrilled about that. And what is a blessing for one person, says Sai Baba, is a blessing for all. Now, the next gift of the Spirit, which we also have, but didn't know until this week, is called same-sidedness, or perceiving the same divinity of God as Holy Spirit, or Atma, A-T-M-A, and all beings, and loving that divinity equally, beyond the ties of family, faith, or nationality. Now, once when he was quite young, one of our sons said to me slightly indignantly, Mom, you treat strangers as if they're as important to you as we are. You treat everybody the same. And I said, well, yes, honey, that's how we're supposed to treat everyone. Just the same, whether they're a general in the army or they're a leader of a nation or they're a waiter in a restaurant or they're a maid in a hotel room, or a garbage collector. Or a son or daughter. Yes, or a son or daughter. That we love everybody, that's our effort and our practice to love everyone as ourselves. You know the saying from the Bible, love your neighbor as yourself, and that's what that means. Not being fooled into believing just because someone is wearing a special uniform of an admiral or a general or whether they're a celebrity that they're any more important than anyone else that's just a role they're playing in the pl the play of life the drama of divinity and we're just playing roles too so we must understand that everybody and every creature of every species deserves 
our complete and utter respect and love. Now, what that means further, I told him, is that, as you know, if you meet a genuine, legitimate beggar or someone who is homeless or doesn't have any shoes or socks or food or sweater and th their feet are hurting them because they're walking on gravel or dirt or glass with no socks or shoes and they're cold because they don't have a sweater, then give them some of your food and socks and shoes or a sweater. You have plenty of socks and shoes and sweaters and clothing and food. So it's our job. This is our, our brother, even though we've never met him before, we don't know his name, we'll probably never see him again. In fact, most of the people that we serve day in and day out we'll never see again, and that's perfectly all right. We just don't reserve our love and our compassion for our friends and loved ones. And that's why Jim and I do so much service, because so many people are suffering from con hunger and cold or loneliness or sadness or illness. If we don't help them, who will? Sai Baba and Jesus teach us to always be on the lookout for people that need our help. And as we said, most of whom we'll just see once in our lifetime, some a few times, some repeatedly. But helping other people makes us happier than anything we've ever done. And we did it long before you children came along. The next one is walking through walls. And now this is when human, humans and animals in their etheric bodies or their physical bodies move through walls and dimensions by a change in frequency which disassembles and reassembles the molecules of their physical or etheric bodies. This may or may not be under their conscious control, but it's organized by God. Now, many people have reported, and we've told you this too, with great surprise, that people have told us that we have walked through walls into their homes or local hospitals or restaurants in order to heal them. But, and they've thanked us profusely or called us up or they've written us letters and we've told them, well, I hate to tell you this, but we can't yet do that consciously or both of us would get a flat nose. <laughs> so God uses us in that way without our knowledge. And he uses you too without your knowledge. Don't take it personally and don't start to get all puffed up thinking you're something special because God just moves us around like puppets, even though we're divine beings. He's the divine puppet master. Now then, the last one is psychic surgery. Now, I don't do psychic surgery, at least not to my knowledge, but this is when a highly evolved person is used by the Holy Spirit within them to enter another person's body without instruments like Stephen Turoff in the UK or many of the other psychic surgeons we've met using their bare hands to move and rearrange or extract tissue to heal the patient. Now, I've been blessed to receive about 10 psychic surgeries over the past 40 years by very gifted Filipino healers who have come to the States and who have been hosted in the homes of people in the metaphysical community, mostly around Boulder, who are very open-minded people and who usually have a deep devotion to Mother Mary or to Kuan Yin. And oftentimes the Philippine healers see Mother Mary standing nearby as they're doing the psychic surgery on the various patients and on yours truly. Now, the Philippines of all the countries in the world has probably produced the greatest number of psychic surgeons in modern times. This um, often runs in the family and is a very sacred gift. Most of these psychic surgeons are men, and I've heard of two women, but there are probably many more that we don't know about because they have to stay under the radar and work very carefully and quietly. Now, speaking of psychic surgeries, several years ago, our friend Tony, a side devotee, came to visit from Hawaii and asked if we would apply matrix energetics to her in our Psy Center meeting room, which has since closed due to CV. So 
Uh, Jim stood behind her to catch her, and as I tapped her on the forehead, she toppled over backwards um, and was laid gently down on the carpet by Jim. Now, this is quite customary, and we've done this with probably thousands of people in the past 11 years. So she was lying face up on the carpet, resting, and then she announced, oh, I've just been told by the masters I'll be down here on the floor a while because they're going to do psychic surgery on my abdomen. <laughs> well, I was so shocked. I said, psychic surgery? In the Psy meeting room right there on the floor right now? They're going to do that with you? And she said, yes. She told me not, to, they told me not to move and it'll be a while. So I just said, oh, well, hmm. I guess I'll just go make some tea for all of us. <laughs> so I did. Now, the Lord is constantly ambushing us with things like that, where we have no idea what is going to happen when somebody comes to visit, which very few people have done in the past two years for obvious reasons because of lockdowns and so on. But he can just do these kinds of things any place, anytime, and he does. Now, once again, he had a, an additional agenda, which he had not mentioned to us as usual about what was going to transpire during her visit. And he keeps telling Jim and me, when we say, can't you give us any clues you're going to be doing some of these things? He doesn't give us any clues. And he says, this is none of your business. What I do with other people is not your business. I'm the doer, not you. I just work through you. All you have to do is just let me. Don't try to block it. Now, this reminds me to tell you a story called The Healing of the Herd Story, H-E-R-D. And this is something that one of my very closest friends, um, whom I've known since she was born, gave me a shocking update on the phone a few days ago about what she has been doing quietly every afternoon, without fail, with her husband, for 16 years. Her, her, her name is Leanne, and she and her husband, William, or Bill, have a large acreage on the top of a remote mountain in West Virginia. It's a gorgeous property. Now, when they moved into their forest property, which they designed and built themselves, they went out to the backyard, which is very, very large, and they noticed that a herd of deer were living in the woods near the house, and they all peeked out through the trees curiously as if to say, what are you doing here in our forest? What are you doing here? Well, since the area gets a lot of snow in the wintertime, they decided to take on the commitment of doing a daily deer feeding each day at dinner time, about five o'clock or so, changing with the seasons and the light so that the deer wouldn't starve. They can get drifts of up to three or four feet in the winter, and some of the deer would starve, and also some hunters would kill some of the deer. So they feed deer 365 days a year, and they have done it for, as we said, nearly 20 years faithfully. But that's not the most astounding thing about the fact that the deer are fed personally by hand by both of them. The deer can be up to 50 in the herd at a time. And the deer have been given names by Leanne, and they also answer to their names as people would and as dogs would. Now, when the, deliver, the, when the mothers deliver their new fawns, either as singletons or twins or triplets, they teach them to do various tricks in order to get more corn as a treat. So about five or six o'clock, the herd will stand patiently at the edge of the wood, waiting for Leanne to call each family by the mother's name. So imagine 50 deer gathered all around the edge of the forest in the shadows, and then Leanne will say in her very soft-spoken Southern way, to one of the deer mothers, whose name is Rella, R-E-L-L-A, Rella, please bring your triplets, Uno, Dos, and Trace, for dinner now. And she, Rella will go getting the 
triplets and bringing them up to stand in front of Leanne. And then Leanne will say, now, if they have any new tricks, they may display their tricks one at a time and will give each of them extra corn after they do their trick. Now, the mother deer quickly realized that Leanne and Bill fell in love with the fawns and started giving them more corn. So that's how the mothers realized, oh, if we teach our babies tricks, they get more food. So that's what they've been busy doing. Now the tricks might be standing on their hind legs and twirling around in a circle or doing an extra high jump or lying down and rolling over or letting one of their dear siblings jump over them, sort of like Evil Knievel used to do a long time ago on his motorcycle. <laughs> they have all kinds of tricks. Now, as we said, when the other deer saw that treats were being given out for doing tricks, then the adult deer all began doing tricks in the woods so that they could practice and so that they could be given extra corn at dinner time. So the next thing Leanne knew, instead of patiently waiting at the edge of the forest as they had been taught to do, all of a sudden they all came running out of the forest, prancing around in a stampede, and all of them the whole tribe, the whole herd, started doing tricks simultaneously, jumping up, twirling around, rolling on the ground. And Leanne was absolutely furious with them for breaking ranks and acting like wild animals. <laughs> Which, of course, they are. They are wild animals. But she refers to them as people. And by the way, if one of them is accidentally called by the wrong name, and that's a lot of names to remember, 50 different deer, I don't know how she recognizes their faces and their features and their coloring, their coats, their size, and so on. But if they are accidentally called by the wrong name, they will just sulk and pout and trot back into the woods in shame, hanging their heads, just like an insecure person might do. So she and Bill have to be very careful that they call each one by the right name at the right time. So after she recovered her equanimity, after the momentary circus show-offs, we're told in no uncertain terms they were never to start showing off all at once ever again. Nope, they had to keep order, and the mothers were to bring the babies forward, and only the babies would get extra corn treat for doing new tricks, nobody else. Now she speaks to them just as I'm doing it. And they understand her full sentences. They understand her tone of voice, her gestures with her hands, the way she nods her head. And if she raises her voice because she's unhappy with them, they're quite alarmed and they look uh, very intently at her and they lean forward and they just make sure that they're doing the right thing and that they understand why she might be unhappy. Now, she told them the adults will continue to get one serving each. And furthermore, she said, pointing her finger at the front door around the corner, that some new deer had been sneaking to the front door, thinking that they would probably get either extra trees or seconds. And she said, there is not going to be any sneaking around to the front door in twos and threes in hope of getting extra treats. No. And she also said she understood that those that were doing that were newcomers to the herd. But they must understand there would be no jumping in front of the food line, no pushing or shoving other beings in line. She called them other people. You can't push other people. And you can absolutely have no fighting whatsoever. This is a very, very peaceful property and family. You're part of our human family. And so we're all one big family and we have to cooperate, and we have to get along. We have to be harmonious. The regular herd members uh, have done this all these years, and if you new people, she said, can't do this, then you might as well leave now. So we all get along in love and harmony and cooperation. If you cannot do this, make up your mind right now, and you can leave. If you have to leave, we understand. <laughs> then she said she told them, Everyone would be expected to come when called and not before and not to miss meals and expect to be fed later. It's just like a dormitory or a family. You can't just show up whenever you feel like and think that the food will be put out for you specially. You come when the meal is served. So 
We intend to keep this very harmonious and organized, she said firmly. And we expect each one of you to respect yourselves, to respect us, to respect the corn, the food, and all the other deer. So all of you have to have, again, love, peace, respect, and protection for the new fawns and for the entire herd family. You must protect each other. We expect individual and group dis discipline and responsibility. And finally, we expect to have a smooth absorption of the newcomers, so make them feel at home and don't show any jealousy or possessiveness toward us or toward the corn bins or toward the property. Everyone shares equally and loves each other equally. So I was so taken by this. I thought, well, this is like um, management leadership for humans or families or neighborhoods or the workplace or any organization. This is wonderful. And to think they totally grok it, they get it, they understand it, they obey. And if they are uh, fussed out uh, or chewed out, they understand it fully and they do not repeat their mistakes. So I made up um, a chart of the leadership for the deer herd because this would work for any species. And Jim is going to read this now. So there are principles that we can get from Leanne's experience with the deer that apply to ourselves. We have to have individual self-discipline and take individual responsibility for things in our lives. We have to have love, respect, peace, unity in ourselves, in our families, and in our herd or our tribe or our larger group, our small communities, our large communities. We have to have group discipline and cooperation in any groups that we are members of. And there needs to be smooth absorption of any newcomers that come into our, into our groups. Thank Furthermore, you. no pushing, no conflict, no competition or showing off or line jumping. And for the deer, this was at dinner time, but for us, it's all the time. Form a queue, form lines. The same rules apply to everybody. There aren't any people that have special rules for themselves or demand specialness. No specialness. Don't expect to be special, except for the children when they're brought forth by their moms. Okay, thank you, Jim. All right, well, Leanne then told me that several times after she was in the backyard giving a little disciplinary talk to the deer herd, that neighbors were driving by and craning their necks, then leaning out of their cars to see if what was happening is what they were really seeing. So then a little bit later, they would stop by uh, the same day or an hour later or something when they had seen her out in the very large backyard. And so they say, would say, well, I'm Sally, I'm your neighbor down the road. And I think I must have been imagining something, but I just had to come and find out if what I thought was happening was really happening and I my husband is waiting to find out too so I thought that we have seen you giving a stern talk to the entire deer herd and that the deed the deer seem to understand and if you were talking to them individually chastising them they were hanging their heads we thought no this is impossible how could deer understand human English or any language? And then we also thought that we had heard you calling small deer families by name. And you would say their name, and then you would mention the names of their children or their offspring. And then three or four had trotted up, and they stood directly right in front of you, paying total attention, looking directly at you. Did we imagine that? Was that true? And Leanne nodded and said, oh yes, that's true, that happens all the time. I like order. And she had had to explain that feeding the herd was very expensive. Every day, 365 days a year for nearly 20 years. And it's also physically stressful. And she's a normal sized person. She's five feet six, ordinary build, and the deer 
are sometimes taller than she is with big antlers, and it's stressful to feed 50 deer every night that could bolt or do something strange at any moment, and that she had to tell the deer if they wanted to continue the arrangement of being dependably fed every evening at dinner time, they were going to have to do their part and behave and cooperate. Otherwise, that Leanne and Bill were just not going to do it anymore. Well, they got it. And then Leanne, uh, as she was talking to her neighbors, said she just moder modestly lowered her eyes and said, well, so far, after feeding them daily in all seasons for 16 years, it seems to be working. Now, I very seldom have to discipline them, you know. They're very sweet, and we love each and every one of them, and they're very good to us. Now, this is absolutely incredible to me. I asked her, I said, this is a gift, don't you understand? This is a rare gift to be able to communicate with individual animals and an entire herd and to make your needs known. How do you think you do that? She said, well, I just didn't know I couldn't do it. I just knew, all right, I will do this for you, but you have to do this for me. You just can't run over us. You have to cooperate. And she said, actually, I read a few articles uh, on scientists and how they think animals understand people. And for example, if you have someone that works in a zoo and they are feeding and training animals and giving them a bath and so on. The scientists think that the animals listen to the tone of voice of the person or the caretaker. They watch their hands, they watch their face and their expressions, they watch their entire body language. And if they get upset with a colleague and they start yelling at them or they shake their finger or something like that, well then the animals note that and note that, uh oh, that's a bad sign, that person's in trouble, or that animal's in trouble. So they pay attention very carefully. But maybe it's just a matter of the fact that they're all telepathically communicating with each other, and in the morphic field of deer, they all get um, the communication when they communicate with each other, and they also intend to make their needs known to other species such as humans. But in any event, I was very deeply touched by that. And Leanne has not only quite a gift, she's an extremely, extremely intelligent person. She's very modest and self-effacing. And she just doesn't understand how gifted she is in a number of life areas. Now, next I want to quickly tell you about several miracles that have happened both recently in the past so that you'll get an understanding as you probably already know that miracles can happen to any creature any species any person or being at any time now the first one of these stories has to do with three people who attended the last live stream gazing i'll say at the outset that virtually everybody saw or felt the presence of the masters most of whom were in the slideshow but that is, they might have felt the presence of one or two or three masters. Now, one woman in Germany who sent us her gazing report through her gazing coordinator said that she had received a pile of Satya Sai Baba's sacred healing ash on her head, saturating her hair during the program. Now, she didn't realize it, that she had a pile of a booty sitting on her head. And so after the program, she checked her phone because we asked most people to turn their phones off and to use paper notebooks because the energies can affect this session. But some people don't have a big screen TV or they just watch the whole thing on their phones. So when she bent down her head to check her messages on her phone, the pile of a booty ash fell down on her phone and head on her hands, causing her to realize that she had received a unique blessing of the Lord. Then a man received a message from Sai Baba, sent that to us. Then another man received a six-hour visit or darshan from Sai Baba. Now, Sai Baba has manifested Vibhuti Ash 
about three or four or five times over the years to gazing attendees. And one time he entirely covered a woman head to toe, and when she got home to change clothes after the program, she found out he had put it even in her socks. Now, only God could put Fabuti ash in your socks without you knowing about it. So he must have done it through some sort of interdimensional uh, means that we don't know about. But it was very exciting and thrilling to hear about. And he's doing all kinds of things for many people all the time. Sometimes he will get people's attention and appear to them, or the masters will, the day before the gazing, the day of, during gazing, or the day after, or several times if they have a situation that needs to be cleared or healed. And you can watch these videos over and over, ask the masters to be present, and get the same results, uh, or even newer or more different results as before. So people are telling this. There's so much information in them that they're taking copious notes and that many people watch one of these gazing videos every single day. Their health has improved, they've received new jobs, new promotions, new income, and all kinds of wonderful healings with families that were estranged or with loved ones or ex-husbands or spouses from whom they were estranged. So just allow anything to happen. Now then, we're going to show this chart on teaching stories and I would say that speaking of Sai Baba, some of you have heard me tell the story about the profusion of miracles that the Lord did during the very first Byron Katie workshop on self-inquiry that I did decades ago, in fact, 30 years ago, in Pagosa Springs, Colorado. The short version of the story is that I had been invited to do the Byron Katie work on self-inquiry for about 30 people one year, and I had no idea what the Lord was going to do for the audience, which absolutely infuriated me at the time because I was so new at teaching that particular workshop, even though I've taught hundreds at the very least of workshops throughout my entire life. So I was in a church basement where they procured the venue and there were 30 people present, as we said. I was sitting on the stage on a chair. There was a table between two chairs, and there was a woman that I was processing in the Byron Katie work who was sitting beside me. Now, um, everybody there had filled out a Byron Katie worksheet. Now, we're not going to go into that today, but I wanted you to get familiar with her teaching and with all of her videos, which she has hundreds of videos, she's outrageously funny and very wise and for decades has been teaching at every imaginable venue around the world. And now they're all available, her talks and workshops online. Well, after 20 or 30 minutes when I was processing this one one, suddenly hands started going up all throughout the audience. And I was wondering, well, why are they raising their hands? Haven't I been clear about the directions? Um, it's really kind of disturbing the flow here. And so I sort of ignored them for about two minutes and they started waving their hands. And then finally they just ignored me and they stood up in the audience. And one person reported that her paralyzed neck had been healed. After 10 years, she had a stiff neck from having been in a car wreck and had um, whiplash. Another person had a sweater over her arm and she said that she always carried a sweater on her arm because it had been paralyzed for like nine years. And she threw off her sweater and said, look, I'm healed, I'm healed. And she started waving her arm in the air and I thought, oh my goodness, what's happening? So my mouth fell open. And then another woman in the front row reported seeing and they were just talking to the audience as if they were a part of the workshop. And she said, I saw a portal open over your head. And then there was my deceased husband and two-year-old son, both of whom died in a car wreck two years ago. And they began smiling and talking to me telepathically. I could hear them perfectly. And she said, I understood that they said that my boyfriend, who is sitting beside me here, um, was really a good man and he loves me very much. 
and he's addicted to marijuana. They know that. They've been watching us all these time since they left the earth. And they said I shouldn't leave him for good today. And actually, all my belongings were in my car, and I was just going to drive away after the workshop because I couldn't stand living with his addictions anymore. And they said, don't do that. It's a big mistake. Just go home together. He's going to be healed of his addictions to alcohol and marijuana today, and he really does love you. Well, of course, he was shocked, but we won't go into that. Then he started talking. What? You were going to leave me? And it was getting to be a little chaotic. Then another person jumped up, and I was just getting very irritated with all these people jumping up. And I felt I had totally lost control of the group, and I didn't know how we were going to get on track again. And this person said, oh, yes, and by the way, I've been watching Jesus and Mother Mary and Sai Baba standing beside you on the stage, giving you loving glances and looking out at us lovingly. Well, by this time, they told me later, my face was beet red. I was just so <laughs> upset. And so I just started silently blasting Sai Baba. Don't do that. Um, I was very ignorant then. And uh, I immediately corrected myself a few moments later. But I just had a few complaints. I said silently, Lord, how could you do this to me? This is so embarrassing. This is so humiliating. Like I don't know how to lead a workshop and everybody is talking at once. And these people are deluded and they're reporting all these visions and experiences right in the middle of this communications workshop. This is about personal growth. This is about psychology. These people are, I hate to tell you this, I, I was so judgmental back then. It's terrible. I'm, I'm so embarrassed to tell you this, but I actually said to him, I don't think this way anymore. Now people probably think I'm one of these. I said, these people are probably holy rollers. They belong in some other kind of a workshop. They're in the wrong room. They should be upstairs in the church sanctuary. And then I told everybody very patiently, I thought, I'm sorry, you're in the wrong venue. This is a communications workshop. This isn't a healing revival. So if you need to leave now, we understand. Well, then they all started talking at once and jumping up out of their seats, arguing with me, countering my every point. And I was thinking, this workshop is failing. It's failing. <laughs> this is a mess. Well, they were indeed in the right place. I was the only one that didn't know. They knew all about this workshop. They were familiar with Byron Katie. They knew what they were attending. They weren't supposed to be upstairs. They weren't holy rollers. Forgive me, anybody who's a Pentecostalist. Um, I don't think of you as holy rollers anymore. And in my workshops, people do a lot of rolling around on the floor. And it's fine because God is working with them. <laughs> well, anyway, they were thrilled that forgiveness could, in fact, create so much profound healing in the first half hour of doing the Byron Katie work. And meanwhile, while they were talking, Sai Baba was telling me, let them talk. They have something to tell you. You're the only one that doesn't know what's going on. And I said, yes, I know. And I don't want this ever to happen again. Now, Byron Katie would say, well, honey, get used to it and look forward to it. And so we did and we are and it's happening again and again. And it's happened thousands of times. So uh, Sai Baba said, now apologize to them and tell them that this is your first Byron Katie workshop that you're doing and that God is now telling you that the way he uses people is none of your business. Oh, <laughs> I said, oh, well. So I was feeling out of control and overwhelmed and I told the Lord, but, but this wasn't exactly the way I expected my life to turn out, being ambushed by him and by crazy strangers while I was trying to help them to use the Byron Katie work for power and clarity in their relationships. And then he gave me very patiently five healing points and asked me to repeat them aloud to the audience and to tell the audience what he was telling me and to stop interrupting him and to stop interrupting them. So we have a chart on that. So I said, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize this is how it worked. I didn't realize you were going to be doing miracles right in the middle of the workshop without telling me first. So these are the five healing points. He said, 
when I said this, I didn't expect my life to turn out like this. He said, well, first of all, tell everybody this. This is not your life. This is my life being lived through you and through all living creatures. Now, secondly, uh, for the most part of your lives, I have been healing other people using you without your awareness and without their awareness. I send my energy, that is God's energy, he said, down through your crown chakra at the top of your head and out through your heart to other people. You don't need to know it. You're just a vehicle. This has nothing to do with you. I'll use anybody I want at any time. I've used all of you all of your lives, even when you were children. Now, number four, when forgiveness occurs, miracles happen. Everything relaxes in your physical, mental, and emotional bodies, and healing can occur regarding paralysis, diseases, illness, injuries, anything. But humility and perfection are important for all of us, and that's why you're doing the Byron Katie work to develop more deep understanding of yourself, to see your projections, and to continually purify yourself so I can use you. Well, this was very illuminating, I must say. I just stood there not knowing what to say after I had told everybody the five points. And so I said, all right, I'm very sorry, Lord. I said that out loud. And I said, um, I just have to accept the fact that he can do anything he wants. He created us, and he's creating us to be co-creators with him. Everybody, even animals, heal each other. All species heal each other. All we have to do is not obstruct what he's doing. So that was very humiliating for me, but then I uh, forgave myself, and he forgave me because I was just acting fearful and human and like a control freak like we do, as most of us do. So this is the last healing story, and then we'll have a teaching story after this about a great manifestation technique. This is the incredible but true story verified on many, many videos online, which you can access, about Anise, A-N-N-I-S-E, Utiendo, U-T-I-E-N-D-O. Isn't that a musical name? Anis Utiendo, who is a Tanzanian or Tanzanian child healer of three years old, who's been used by God to heal thousands of people, just like he's used our bodies to heal thousands of people. She's been doing it in the first three years of her life. She's in Africa, as we said, and she pours water over the heads of the people who come to her parents' property. And she has usually a small blue plastic cup that she dips into a pitcher of water that somebody holds up. And her father carries her around in his arms, and then he bends her over toward the people that are sitting in the dirt of their front yard or standing or kneeling. And she is the 11th child in a Catholic family who has some other remarkable aspects about her and her life, we'll tell you now. Now, instead of being in her mother's womb before she was born for nine months, as is customary, as you know, she was there for three years. Now, I can't imagine that. It's hard enough being pregnant for nine months, but three years? Oh, my goodness. And she was not in any way ill or harmed by being there um, for three years. The mother was perfectly healthy, and the doctor said, we don't understand this. And then when she'll come when she comes. Three years later, she arrived. Now, when she was seven months old, seven months she started walking and talking. Now that usually happens when babies are maybe one to two years old. So again, she was quite remarkable in her development and her arrival and then her developmental skills after she had arrived and was a toddler. She, like yours truly, is also a Marian visionary. That means that Mother Mary appears to her and that Mother Mary asked her to build a stone church for Mary, a charming, tiny, open air, blue and white chapel has been created, which has a very large ga glass enclosed uh, area of a statue of Mother Mary holding 
baby Jesus. So that has just been completed and it can hold about 10 people with uh, room on the outside. It's made in the round. So it's a circular building and outside the little tiny chapel, there is room for about 40 more people to stand or sit in the courtyard that surrounds the new tiny chapel. Now, this is another story you won't believe, but it's true. Recently, she was playing with friends, um, walking along the dirt road. And now the people there are extremely poor. They have mud, tufa, brick houses, and the houses are set on earthen floors. So they live their lives mostly on a dirt floor inside their hut. Now, recently she was playing with friends, walking along the road, which is not paved, when all of a sudden a wall of flames suddenly appeared. Anise announced that she was going to see her mother now, as if to dismiss the children. And then she walked toward the wall of flames, and her friend said, no, no, your mother is not there. No, no, your mother is back home. Your mother is back home. And at three years old, Anise said very calmly, I am not speaking of my biological mother, but of my true mother, Mary. Now, most three-year-olds don't speak uh, in multisyllables, although many more are these days because they are so extremely bright as they're born. But she gen then entered the flames, and the children, who thought these were real flames, even though they were etheric flames, they thought she had been burned up in a fire. So. They ran home to report the event to her mother. Anise disappeared in a big fire. <laughs> well, shortly after that, Anise came walking home in perfect condition and to her parents began to recite both the Hail Mary prayer as well as the prayer for healing by St. Ignatius of Loyola, neither of which she had ever been taught. That was remarkable that she was taught at one time it just took a few minutes. She knew it. She remembered it. Then she walked back home before her mother could even run outside to see if she had, in fact, been burned up in a wall of fire. Well, other things have happened that have happened to Sai Baba when he was also a child. And that is several times local people have tried to poison her with Dr. Juice or poison bananas. Each time with her divine powers, she immediately detected the poison and asked the people who were trying to poison her with juice or bananas, why have you tried to poison me? Why have you tried to poison me? And then she refused to take the food or the drink. Now we have a chart on Anis Utieno, and here it is. So as we said, she pours water on the afflicted, and sometimes she pats her two little hands on the heads of the afflicted people, just uh, one little pat, and then they're healed. She, as we said, was in the womb for three years, walked and talked to seven months, and gets apparitional visits from beloved Mother Mary. She did indeed persuade her parents to build a stone church for Mary that's finished now, and other building is going on in the area. And then, as we just told you, people have tried to poison her. Now, thank you, Jim. Okay. Mother Mary told me a long time ago that child healers were going to be giving compelling sermons from church pulpits, which they're doing in the United States, wearing little suits and shirts and ties and um, looking very much like a miniature minister or a priest. And they are also, these children, resurrecting people from the so-called dead. They are healing the afflicted. And they're giving prophecies very cogently, very articulately. And they're doing this in Africa as well as uh, in the United States and other countries. They're doing this in both Protestant and Catholic Christian households in Nigeria, Tanzania, Mozambique, Kenya, and elsewhere. Now then, we're going to teach a skill set, and this is about, about healing your eyes. Many people have been going blind lately around the world, 
and there are many speculations as to the cause. So if you look up in your Grigory Grabovoy book on healing, and of course he's written many books and others have as well now, I think there are 10 or 12 or more, then you can find the Grigory Grabovoy vision code for eye strain or eye burn or for cataracts or for injuries to the cornea. There are many different codes for different eye problems. Also, you can look up EyeBright as a supplement and other supplements online that are used specifically for the healing of eyes. Now, these supplements are usually in pills and they're ingested and they work, especially EyeBright. Now, you can also look up in the Louise Hay book, You Can Heal Your Life. What am I not seeing? What do I see that I don't like? Every disease has a particular belief or a thought that creates the disease in form. Now then, you can also spray plasma energy water, and Jim is going to show you how to do that, uh, on a sleeping mask and then just wear it at night. So we put some of our plasma energy water, we've told you about that many times, you can look it up online, on a mask. I was having floaters in my eyes, and so two nights in a row, I used the mask after just spraying it once and letting it dry, and the floaters were gone in two days. I had the mask on while I slept for about eight hours, two nights in a row, and it worked perfectly. So thank you, Lynn Schmaltz, for creating all of your wonderful ideas and products about the Plasma Energy Solutions. And her website is plasmaenergysolution.com. That's singular, solution.com. Now then, we have told you that we would show you some processes for healing, and we've just done this. And the second one now is something that I found was just extraordinary. This is something I learned to do about 30 years ago, and it works just as well now. And I just had to tell you the story. It was by Esther Hicks, who does the Abraham material, and there are hundreds of her videos online. So she told us when I first saw this that we should take a blank sheet of paper, put the words on the top, let the universe do it and then put a vertical line making two columns, uh, the vertical line down the middle, and to label the one on the left, my to-do list, and then the one on the right, the universe's list. She said this is for very fast manifestations. You don't have to do any huffing and puffing and uh, efforting. You just write these things down. So write down the things that you might do in a day. So my to-do list for that day was number one, design a gazebo and price the labor and the materials. So the gazebo design took me far less than an hour. And, and then I made a few calls and priced the labor and materials. And then I wrote a book chapter. And so that probably took about two hours to do two drafts. Then I planned a trip to India. I booked a hotel. I found a good itinerary and airfare, and Sai Baba had appeared in our living room a few days before and said, as he has done 55 times over the past 40 years, I want you to bring these seven people to India. These are their names. If they don't feel they can come or they can't get permission from their manager or their spouse, or they feel they don't have the money, tell them I will give them the money I always give people the money to come if I invite them and the money to afford the airfare, the hotels, the meals, the rickshaws, the cabs, and everything else. Uh, and if they won't come and receive my invitation, then this is a backup list of seven other people. Well, we just do not invite our friends to go to India. Sai Baba told us, I am inviting them because I want to heal them or instruct them or chastise them, or do something with them that's not your business. So y you are never to invite your friends. Just invite the people that I tell you to invite. So that's how that works. Now then, so I had on the list my three things, the gazebo, the book chapter, the trip to India. 
And then on the right side, I couldn't think of anything to ask for or to intend. I have everything I want and need. I, there's hardly anything I can think of that I want. I'm perfectly satisfied and happy. And in interviews over the years, Sai Baba has said to me, what do you want? And I say, nothing, Lord. I'm perfectly happy with your love. You provide everything for me. And one time he said, just tell me what you want. Isn't there anything? And I said, well, I guess one thing. I just want to be like a match, M-A-T-C-H, that when, like a wooden stick match, that when it is struck, sets hearts on fire for the love of God. I want to send, set hearts on fire for the love of you everywhere I go. I just want people to fall in love with you as I have because they will love it so much. So that was it. Well, it took me a while to think about what to put in this second column. So I had heard that the Dalai Lama was coming to speak in Boulder, and he was a very good speaker at the time. So I called around to get tickets, and they said, sorry, they were sold out the first day. There are no tickets left. And I thought, okay, I'm going to make my three intentions very difficult because um, Esther says these things can happen like within 48 hours. And I thought, I, I'm going to make this really hard to put universe to the test. So I thought, all right, the tickets are sold out. There's no way I can get any tickets to go hear the Dalai Lama at the auditorium at CU and Boulder. So I put down, I would like free tickets to hear the Dalai Lama in Boulder. And I would like somebody to call me up and offer them to me. And then the second thing was, I had check to see if I could join a workshop training. I think it was about two weeks long and cost $10,000, which I wasn't going to pay, um, for EMDR training, which has to do with the movement of the eyes and healing of certain patterns and beliefs and thoughts and so on. So I really wanted to learn that, but I wasn't attached to it just as I wasn't attached to seeing the Dalai Lama. Okay, fine. If I wasn't supposed to hear him, I wasn't supposed to have the EMDR training, that's fine. But I said, okay, just for fun, I am going to put down on my list, I would like someone that I know who has had the entire course in EMDR training, call me up, tell me that they would like to come and teach me the EMDR training for free. Now that would never happen. How could that possibly happen? And in two days, no. So I said, okay, universe, this is a challenge to you. I want the whole entire workshop for free by somebody that knows it well and is competent to teach it and feels that I've done so much for them that they want to do that for me. So there. And then finally, my car was very old and I really needed a new car. And so I decided, you know, I would like to get a used car. We always get used cars in good condition with good mileage because as soon as you drive cars off the lot, sometimes they devalue from 10 to 15 or $20,000 depending on the price of the car. So I wasn't going, we're very thrifty so that we can do more service. So we're very careful in stewarding our funds so we can help more people. So I said, I would like to have a low mileage car in great condition uh, in a silver color, beige leather interior, and I'd like to pay cash for it. Well, I didn't have that much money just sitting around at the time that I could just go find the perfect car. I knew the make and the model I wanted, so I put that down on my list, and that was that. Now, what happened was that this was on a Thursday morning, and on Saturday, what happened was that I received a call from a friend who said that she had two tickets to the Dalai Lama. She couldn't go and hear him talk, but she knew that I would love to go and hear him. And she said, you've always helped me so much. I've never done a single thing for you. I would like to offer you those tickets and I can even bring them over to your house. I said, oh my goodness, really? And so I thanked her profusely and said, well, what gave you the idea? She said, it just popped into my mind. Call Connie, offer the tickets to her. She would enjoy it so much. And I said, that's amazing. Yes, I would. And thank you, thank you, thank you so much for thinking of me. Then the next thing that happened was that a friend that I had not seen that had moved to Ohio some years before 
called up and said, I'm in town and I would like to come and see you on Saturday morning. Would you have time for me? And I said, well, yes, why don't you come over for tea and we'll talk and catch up for about an hour. Well, as soon as he walked in the door, he said, you know, in all these 20 years I've known you, I have always turned the conversation to me. In fact, I've usually tried to turn it into a free counseling session for myself. I very seldom have asked how you and Jim are doing. And uh, it's all been about me, 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 my, and mine. And he said, I finally realized that. And I have taken the full course in EMDR. And I wanted to let you know that this is something I can do for you. So uh, instead of talking about me today, uh, if you want to spend more time, I have become very competent in it. And I can teach you the entire EMDR course today. Would you like that? And I just stared at him and said, you don't know how much I would like that. I thank you so much. This is extraordinary. How did you get that idea? He said, it just came to me. Teach Connie EMDR. This is the time she would like it. She really would want it. And you're the one. And I said, well, I'm speechless. And thank you. Let's, I'm ready if you're ready. And so we did spend the day on that. Then... A little later, after he left, Jim said to me, you know, no, I had not told anyone about wanting to get a new car. My car was not broken in any way. It had always been a wonderful car. And I was a bit attached to it, just out of fondness for its good service. And um, so I didn't tell anyone. I was thinking, oh, you know, I should get a new car before it starts to wear out. And I'd like a silver one with beige leather interior and this make and model. So Jim and I were sitting next to each other in the living room, and Jim said, well, you know, I've been thinking. And I said, yes. He said, well, I've been thinking you need a new car. Well, I perked up, and I said, really? He said, well, you know, not new, not brand new, but a car in excellent condition, and we'll have that checked out, and with very low mileage, and that has no marks on it at all. Um, and I think I found one. And it's over at such and such a dealership. And it's silver with beige leather interior. Well, I nearly <laughs> fell off my chair. I said, really? How did you get that idea? He said, it just occurred to me. So the past two days, I've been looking at all kinds of ads. And I think I found one that will really work. And he said, the make and the model are, and it was the same one I was thinking of. And then he said, and I really said, OK, I give up, universe. This really can be easy, this manifestation. Let the universe do it. He said, I got a bonus at work of this many thousands of dollars. And he said, we can pay cash for it. So if you like this car, then we can just go right over there. How about now? Do you want to go now and just go and you could drive it? I called them up and said we might be coming, but I didn't want to make any decisions for you, especially since I hadn't even told anyone. And I said, well, I haven't told anyone either. And it's the same kind of car that you found. And... Now you're telling me we have the cash to pay for it? This is so amazing. The upshot is we went over, we drove the car, we had it checked out, we liked it, and it worked perfectly. All of those things happened within 48 hours. So here I was trying to make this impossible for the universe or God or for the devas to provide three things that I thought they never could do, and especially in short order. Well, you know that the Course in Miracles says there is no time constraint, that we are masters, we are divine, and that it is as easy to heal cancer as to heal the common coal. And by the same token, it is just as easy to manifest things that you think will not come forth, but you just intend them, and then you let them go. You release them. You don't huff and puff and think, oh, I want to make it happen. And no, you just write it down, intend it, and let it go. That's the secret. All right. Now then, we have invaluable resources for you. These are books that I think everybody would do well to have, and you can get them used online. You can try them on eBay or Amazon. So the Alice Bailey books are by the Tibetan master Jual Kool, and I think they're at least 100 years ahead of their time. And you can see mine is quite battered. 
I have about 20 of them. I don't know how many of them have been written, but um, they are extraordinary. And Ma Master Joel Cool, this is on esoteric healing, as you can see. He is a wonderful, wonderful master that's in the slideshow and that helps all of us every time. Now, some people are trying to imply that the Lucis Press, Lucis means light. Alice Bailey and her husband Foster were very saintly people who worked tirelessly their whole lives to take the dictation from Master Joel Cool uh, for the healing ideas and the foundational philosophies and consciousness ideas in the books. So don't believe anyone who is bashing them or who is trying to defame our founding fathers and mothers or any of the saints you see in the slideshows. The Foxfire books are next. Now the Foxfire books, I think there are maybe nine or ten of them. They look like this. You can get them online, new or used at Amazon, and they're about self-reliance, how-tos, healing, remedies, gardening, and so on. Now this one says, this one is the first one. Now I think most of you probably don't need to know about how to build a log cabin or how to dress a hog, for example. But these are treasures from the Appalachian heritage of the country on how to live off the grid um, and be self-reliant. So this one is how to plant by the signs, snake lore, hunting tales, faith healing, and various other affairs of plain living and self-reliance, it says. The next one, um, and I have about seven. I don't need all of them. This one, Foxfire number three, is about animal care, how to create and build banjos and dulcimers, how to tan hide, summer and fall, wild plants for foraging, how to make butter and a butter churn, how to grow your own ginseng or fine ginseng, which is very expensive and a wonderful crop to grow or to find, and then still more affairs of plain living. And then finally, this wonderful, wonderful series is called the Anastasia Ringing Cedar Series. There are nine books by Vladimir Megre in Russia. And this is about creating conscious, intentional communities for the upcoming new age. Now then, thank you. Oh, also, we have Such As I Speaks. Now, there may be more than 42 volumes of his divine discourses and teachings now, but I would say they're invaluable, and if you can find them uh, or if somebody will give them to you, please uh, take them because they're just the highest awareness that you'll come in contact with. Next, Master the Mind by Sadhguru Sri Madhusudan Sai, and he is the latest um, representation of Sai Baba. He is quite alive and well and vibrant and teaching constantly online. The free online course in self-realization is easy to understand. It's excellent, and Jim and I have done it three times. Now then, number six, You Can Heal Your Life by Louise Hay about the emotional causes of illness. All right. Now we would like to thank you for coming and profusely thank the Lord and the masters and angels for helping all of us. The next gazing is tentatively, as we said, going to be on Saturday, July 9th at 2 o'clock, Mountain Daylight Time. Your assignment for the next time is to fill out a new sheet on the Judge Your Neighbor worksheet and to bring that with you when you watch one of the Byron Katie videos. So watch one of her videos like, for example, on your relationship with your parents or uh, your manager or your children, or a neighbor or a spouse, somebody that does not love you very much or that you do not love entirely. That's the kind of person you want to put down and fill in the six blanks of the six questions on the Judge Your Neighbor worksheet. Then do the turnarounds as you watch her 
processing other people. The more you do this, the more clarified you'll become and the more God could use you for one of his pure vessels for healing and miracles. And now you may meditate as long as you wish. Remember to note down all of your experiences that happened to you today, insights, hearing voices, feeling a master pat you on the shoulder or seeing um, the Lord or angels or anything that might have happened to you, with you, through you, or for you. Just jot those down and send those to your quantum gazing coordinator. Now, if you don't have a coordinator, you can just send your report or a paragraph or two or tell us as long and uh, writing as you like what happened to you. And you can send that report or testimonial to info, I-N-F-O, at ConnieShaw.com. That is spelled C-O-N-N-I-E-S-H-A-W dot com. Thank you so much, beloved Lord, Ascended Masters, angelic host and all of you and thank you for jim for your wonderful technical support and all of the work that you did to prepare our program today and now we will say once again we love you the masters love you love yourself forgive yourself namaste and farewell